How's everyone going? I think the only wisdom I really can share is doing my hair, which I've only learned really about the last couple years, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that because there's some entrepreneurship connection. Um, before I get into some other stuff, a little bit about me, um, I'm from Lemington, obviously with the Lemington Bowl. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more uh, about that. I'm a recovering banker, so that wasn't talking about my bio. I still literally get tons of PTSD when I go into a bank to deposit a check, to get money or anything. Um, so I'm so happy about that. I have really, 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 really bad rest and bitch face syndrome that I'm coming from recovery from. So you can judge me right away. I promise once I warm up a little bit, um, a little bit more uh, friendly. And lastly, this is mostly for my beautiful fiance over there, refusing to cut my hair before our wedding because I really do want to try out for Aquaman too. I really think I have a chance at it. Um, but a lot of you know what I'm going to talk about today, I'm not a futurist, I'm not a big visionary from that standpoint, but I'm going to share a lot of data. And whether it's teaching at Grand Valley, doing a workshop, doing a keynote, or anything along those lines, I really want to get people thinking. So I am going to share a lot of obvious stuff. You're going to go, no shit, I know that already, right? But I want you to think about it from a different perception or a different point of view um, more than anything. The world is changing very, very fast. And when I hear my grandma talk about it, it's a different perception, right? When I hear my mom talk about it, when I hear my students talk about it, it's, it's very, very different. So I want you to continuously think about that. One of the first things I do during the uh, beginning of my classes is whether it's entrepreneurship or management class or finance class, I get them thinking about data and how technology is changing. So if you look at these two visions, or these two pictures, I guess you should, I should say, um, picture a scenario where you have a loved one that's in the hospital. Currently, what we do is we call and we text them. We reach out to them, right? They tell us where they're at, where we know where the hospital is at. What I'm trying to get you to think about or and or my students is, 10 years from now, with the amount of data, it's gonna be analyzing our text messages, which it's already, everyone's already doing, right? It's gonna analyze our, our location. It's gonna know where our aunt is, where our grandma's at, who's been texting who, and when you walk into a hospital, you're no longer gonna see a sign like that. You're gonna see augmented reality that's giving you arrows pointing to you what floor to go to, what room number it is. So I just give that preface to students or anybody really to think about. I know it's really obvious some of the things in terms of what technology, and I probably watched um, way too many of the shows on Netflix to, to get me really you know, thinking outside the box, but it's, it's very, very important, no matter what business you have, to think about that perception of technology and how customers and customer behavior will interact with it. The other thing that's interesting about 10 years ago, um, yes, Facebook was around, but Uber, Airbnb, um, LinkedIn, all these things weren't what we think of them as they are today. So we have to remember that there are so many things that weren't around. Um, but I want, to, I want you to think about, as I continue in this uh, talk, about, like I said, perception. We can throw in there a little bit of the point of view. We can throw in words like emotional intelligence and those types of things. But the definition of business perception, I put this up here on the screen really quick, is the process by which people translate sensory impressions into coherent and a unified view of the world around them. Though necessarily based on incomplete and unverifiable or unreliable information, perception is equated to reality for most practical purposes and guides human behavior in general. And I'll visit this more, but what I really, really want you to think about is people's background as well. Are we rich? Are we poor? Are we young? Are we old? Are we educated? Do we have skill sets and those types of things? Because they relate directly to consumer behavior, to customer behavior, and other things that we can talk about. I just realized I have to do this. That is the 1989 Batmobile. When I make a net worth of $100 million, you know I'll buy that. I'm not buying a BMW or anything else in the meantime. I'm waiting for my Batmobile. Who out of curiosity knows what all four of these images mean? The website heat map. We got a website heat map. So we got one. Foot traffic. We got some foot traffic going on. Somebody else knows. Thermal GIS. Close. So I threw in the fourth one for a reason, because I think most people would get it. 
But yes, the first one is actually eye movement tracking on websites, which a lot of us know this probably in the room. You can do it with eye movement, with computer clicks and all that. But I'm going back to perception. What does it look like somebody that's 80 years old on a website if they're a potential customer versus 15 years old? So it's just something to think about. The second one, um, I'm not 100% sure, I think it's a school, but it's just basically showing where people are stopping more in terms of them moving. And you probably can't see it, but this is the first urinal in that bathroom right there. So obvious kind of tracking of movement like that. This one over here is tracking of retail movement. So you can't probably see it very well, but there's a deli counter here, a deli counter over here. So all those individual lines represent how a person entered that area. They can track how long they stopped somewhere, what they looked at, et cetera, et cetera. And the last one I had to throw in there, because I knew nobody would get all four of those, I believe it's in Yellowstone, and that's a different wolf pack tracking. So you can see how they don't go into each other's territory for a reason. Um, but again, perception, what does that mean? What can we learn from it? So just a little bit more background, I know some of this is the bio, I said I was a recovery banker. Um, did a lot of consulting, I think more of my focus is in operations consulting, so I'm sharing some of this again about my perception and my perspective, my point of view as I continue in this. Um, consulting wise, I feel very, very blessed that I wasn't in a company that I focused on something. So I wasn't marketing or this or anything else. I had the opportunity to work with um, Mancinos, it's large franchises, I had the opportunity to work with uh, uh, Mofi, which is one of Apple's first certified uh, partners, GE Healthcare, so all sorts of other big companies. Education-wise, I've just always found myself, whether it's uh, as an adjunct or doing something, working with entrepreneurs, I love to work with people. And it's not usually, for me, honestly, um, I mean, I love giving feedback and those types of things, but I love learning. I love learning from people when they come say, hey, I'm working on this and doing this. I constantly want to learn new things, and it's a great, great opportunity. So a couple of quick things just to talk about, and I mentioned this from the perspective of I'm really trying to help my students in terms of build my network in Grand Rapids. I've only been here a couple of years, so I'm trying to reach out more. Um, one project in particular, just to talk about what Grand Valley does, what I try to do as an entrepreneurship instructor, is connect with people in the community. So Goodwill has been one of my partners in my entrepreneurship classes. And just to share some stats about Goodwill, and this was all new to me. First off, Goodwill is a national brand. Um, a lot of people don't realize that. So our local Goodwill in the Grand Rapids area encompasses 19 stores in one distribution kind of center, and I'll explain what that means. And the reason that is, and again, this is all new to me, so I'm gonna share with all of you, is it's based on the mission. So if the mission is homelessness, or jobs, or children's education, that's why the Goodwill brand has different kind of components of how they are. Um, but the biggest thing that I want everybody to understand, because we're, we're having huge, huge issues with overconsumption, is everything in these 20 stores that people donate, only 50% of that is actually bought by people that go to a thrift store. The other 50% logistically has to go to their center, where they then sort it out, or they sell it by a pound. So it's like a dollar nineteen a cent, dollar nineteen cents a pound for anything, t-shirts. Um, electronics, anything, you just bring it up on a scale and they pay for it. Of that 50% that didn't get sold at the store, only 10% is actually sold at the outlet center. The remaining 40% is either waste, bundled, and sold on the commodities market. So for me, it's very, very important as an educator to get hands-on experience. So we went in there, we went through their outlet center, we looked at their, their issues that are going on, we saw the bins full of belts and cords and all sorts of stuff, and then the students tackle different projects of how they can monetize or potentially turn something into a product or an opportunity. Like Google Plastics Group, is that's what they focus on. There is so much plastic. Um, the, the Goodwill in Grand Rapids wastes about ten dollars to $15,000 a year just in processing that plastic. So my point of making again is hands-on experience and trying to connect them with more people, all my students in the community, so I'm always open to working with uh, other folks. Uh, another company that I worked with as a student, she's by far been the most successful of all students. I'm not taking full credit. She is an animal. She goes out there and does stuff. But I just want to share this, especially if you know college entrepreneurs, there's so much money out there in terms of pitch competitions and other things. She has won over $75,000 the last two years in pitch competitions across the country. Um, and she's making a good amount of money now selling her product online. So again, I can't stress enough if you know people um, in school to do those stuff. And utilize some of the additional resources. Um, I can't, again, stress enough to encourage people 
um, to use some of those resources on campuses. So entrepreneurship, blab a little bit about myself, uh, a lot because if I can help anybody out there, here's some of the things I've worked on, uh, as well as you know, just building my network to help some students. Um, so I broke it up as kind of the Save by Bell, uh, Save by the Bell-ish theme early years in college years, and I call myself an adult-ish. I think until I'm married, I'm still kind of growing up a little bit. I'm still a work in progress, but just talking about some of the things um, I've done in terms of the Lettington Wall, that's kind of my big project right now. Every weekend I'm up there doing fun stuff, um, very old building. For me, when people talk about entrepreneurship in terms of passion, and I've learned over, I think, even the last couple of years, it's all about the process for me. There's certain things that I really, really enjoy, but I love the challenge. I love learning about how to get a diamond bit grinder for a floor polisher and polish my floor, because I never learned about that stuff. I built a machine to rip up carpet for $150, when somebody told me it would cost $4,000 to rip all the carpet out of my building. I love that stuff. I love going on and learning those types of things. Um, I've worked a lot with QuickBooks. I was one of the first people to like integrate Google Apps 10 years ago with a lot of companies, so it was free for users. Um, this big guy right here, him and I, well, about the same size, I'm a little skinny right there. Um, you know, had some fun with the company. Um, so all sorts of different things. College students in terms of social um, aspects. I've been a vending company before with multiple employees. Um, anyways, I'm gonna move on about me. So going back to the keynote in terms of what I really want us to think about or what I want you guys to think about in terms of perception and learning. So I work right now with a lot of 20-year-olds, 18, 19, 20, 20 22-year-olds, right? So for me, I think I have an advantage out of everybody in this room that doesn't work with that age because they're our future purchasing power, right? I understand their mindset. But an interesting question for you. As I was following, as some of the rest of us were following all this year's stuff going on, were they going to get approved, you know, for the bankruptcy thing? Approximately every semester, I have about 160 students. Just out of curiosity, when I surveyed all of my students, what percentage do you think said they shop or will shop at Sears? Zero. Exactly. Zero. I'm going to move on. I don't think I need to preach about that stat, but. But my point, as you guys can see, it's very interesting to see what they have going on versus some of these 60 years old that are running business and everything else in this world. Read, read, read. Not something an educator should admit, but I probably read about five books from front to back. Um, my favorite book is Thinking Grow Rich, so if you've never read that book, read that book. What I do like to read is an, a boatload of articles. So find good articles or content that you can read especially if you're younger and learning about new things. So back to perception. Before I go into this, I want to think about, I want you to think about whatever business you're currently working on, what business you work at. Um, I want you to think about old people, young people. I want you to think about opportunities. And then lastly, it's been really, really interesting talking to students about this whole thing dealing with influencers. Who has younger people in terms of kids or nephews or people that you work with that are younger in this room? So all of you guys know what I'm talking about. The cool thing now is to be an influencer, right? What's really, really interesting is learning their perception and their perspective of what's authentic and real. So we all know everything has affiliate links nowadays. Anything we search and try to buy, it's bullshit. Somebody's trying to sell us something, right? So think about that as I kind of continue some of what I'm talking about. So one thing, and other people are talking about this too, because it's so, so important, um, is everyone is a media company. Whether it's you as an individual or it's your company as a business. Everyone. So I'm going to share a lot of stats with you guys. And again, these stats are made for you to think about what is going on. And it's up to you for how it can relate to your type of business or situation. So Google accounts for 90% of all online searches worldwide. I can stand up here and say Google is the number one search engine and everyone goes, yeah, no shit. But 90%, right? Here's some data to back up some of these obvious things that we all know about. But when you see some data, and I put the links up there for a reason, there's my source. So I'm not just full of a bunch of, you know, 
Google Android operating system runs 85% of all phones in the world. Facebook ruthlessly buys out or copies this competition, which means it now owns the four most popular apps in the world. Again, a lot of us know this stuff, but have you really thought about it in terms of marketing, where your customers are, how can you reach people? Are you really a media company? Think about it for a second. How many of you have seen this graphic before? Couple. So if it's difficult for you to see, we all know a gentleman named John D. Rockefeller. So 100 years ago, approximately, he had his company. Government stepped in, said, you guys own too much of this company. So what I want you to see is, is we got all these companies here. We then started combining. We then merged. And now we're back to our four as of today. We're not a monopoly anymore. But did it really do anything? Did it really stem those types of things? How many of you know how much Rockefeller was worth back then in today's dollars? Does anybody want to take a guess? Like three hundred billion. Last I saw it was over four hundred billion, four hundred and seven billion. I've heard three thirty to like four hundred seven. So just keep that in context. If you haven't read, Bezos was worth around one hundred twenty-five billion. Now, the reason I bring that up is this. When you click ship their unmatched network of artificial intelligence, data analysis, warehouses, airplanes, and drivers springs into action. Amazon is so good at what they do, 60% of households subscribe to Amazon Prime. Notice that was in 2017. I guarantee you it's higher than that now. When Amazon comes to town, it's not just their workers who suffer. One analysis showed on average wages drop for all warehouse workers in the area and drop as much as 30%. Now, I don't want to call out every city, including Grand Rapids, who's trying to push for them to come, because I know there are probably plenty of research to go against what this is saying. But again, something to think about. What is going to happen? Over one million online businesses use Amazon's cloud services. And most of you know that's continuously building and building and building. So not only are we going to buy everything from them, but everybody's going to host everything. It's really, really hard, and I was trying to find a better uh, graphic for this. Um, but up in the right-hand corner, what I've been reflecting a lot, and again, I'm trying to pass on some things that I talk to my students about, get everybody else thinking about them. Those little dips that we see in the red are the recessions that we've seen. You've probably heard the analogy before every 10 years or so, right? We're riding the high right now, so what's going to happen next? What's scary to me is seeing a lot of entrepreneurs overextending themselves posting their Porsche and their BMWs on LinkedIn saying, look at my two cars. The other thing to think about is everyone should be going home tonight and researching what companies survived 10 years ago and learning from that and what has changed since then. So it's just something really interesting to think about. So some other stats, and again, I share these stats as a reminder, think about your business that you're working on or think about the businesses that you might work on. How is it going to be affected? On some capacity, it will be affected somehow. So 10,000 baby movies are turning 65 every day, and we have no good plan in place for how we're going to take care of them. 52% of American households are at risk for not having enough money to maintain their standard of living when they retire. Who's going to buy anything, right? And nearly half of Americans ages 32 to 61 have no retirement savings at all. So some very interesting stats to think about. My age, being a millennial, and I hate admitting that, by the way. And for the record, I'm an older one, so don't pump me into some of the younger ones. But working with these college students and thinking about my generation, our mindsets are so, so different in terms of retirement, of buying houses, and all of these things. So again, I challenge you to see if any of this data is relevant to your businesses. For me, I'm not... You know, they got, I don't have any startups in the food industry, but when I look at some of these stats, and we all know some of these issues that are going on with food waste and um, the, the grocery stores that pull all the damaged product and all that, but look at some of these stats. And the reason I share some of these stats, number one, it's grotesque. But number two, I think there's so much opportunity in this industry to capitalize on various opportunities. So with the exception of baby food, and I'm sharing this mostly because it just pisses me off, with the exception of baby food, the federal government actually doesn't require daily leave of any kind. Did anybody else know that? That's what I thought. 
you know, it, it makes me sick. So eggs last a lot longer than what you know, and I'm not going to ramble off, a lot of people are shaking their head, they know some of this stuff, but this is why I shared that. One survey found that 83% of Americans have prematurely thrown out food based on the self I did. Over in developing countries, they've, they've created systems that can text message, if a farmer grows corn and a farmer grows potatoes, they can throw it out in a text message and say, I got a lot of potatoes, I got a lot of corn, and they can connect and trade. Why are we not doing that in a sense? I'm not saying call your neighbor and say, hey, what do you got that's go bad? I need some stuff. But there are better ways, I think. I don't know what the, I don't know what the opportunities are. I don't know what the businesses are. But I think there's something here, and that's why I want to share that with all of you. So we're wasting perfectly good food uh, while millions go hungry. Uh, in 2015, 42.2 uh, 2 million Americans lived in food insecure households, including over 13 million children. So again, something to think about, I think there are a lot of opportunities for people to capitalize. Other interesting data. Has anybody heard about the research that was done on Ashley Madison uh, with MSU and Tulane University? This is going to blow you guys away. Super, super interesting. Think about Tom's company a little bit with this, and I'll, and I'll explain why. Um, so my source, and I'll explain why it's garbage in a second, but how many of you know what Ashley Madison is first? Let me ask that. Okay. So those of you that don't know what Ashley Madison is, it's pretty much the uh, portal for men or women who want to cheat on their spouses. So you go up there, it's people that are married or not married. And so let me show you what happened. So what ended up happening with this, those of you that don't know about Ashley Madison, was their uh, website got hacked. And what got hacked with it was everyone's usernames, which included email addresses, which is a lot of data, which is really juicy data too, right? So there was a professor at MSU, another professor at Tulane got this data. For the record, it was hacked, so we all know it's not reputable, right? So we're not posting something in Forbes or ink, or anything along those lines. But here's some interesting things they learned about the data from Ashley Madison. Guys, in this college found that companies with higher number of Ashley Madison users were more likely to engage in unethical behavior, but they're also more likely to be creative. So we got a positive, I guess. And just, just to remind you, these were people who, who used their company email addresses to sign up for the service. So that's what they did. They pulled out all the email addresses and put them into different companies and started looking at the data. They look at whistleblower stuff, they look at news articles. So here's another interesting thing. Firms with higher proportion of Ashley Madison users were more than twice as likely to be associated with corruption or bribery, more likely to have had an accounting uh, mistake over the past year. Firms with higher proportion of Ashley Madison users were also more likely to be innovative, cared more about research and development, and applied more facts. Take it for what it's worth. It's data. That's the point I'm trying to make to you. Not reputable data, but definitely data in itself. Like college students, just some fun data to share with you. They spent on average $2,000 on pizza over four years. So I know the college market very, very well. So next big things. All of this stuff we've been told before, or we think about before, but again, I, I want you to think about data, I want you to think about what relates. So I wrote this down because I went through it, Windows 95, I can still remember getting that. Um, the early web, you know, the early, or, I'm sorry, the late 90s, early 2000s. And then social media came out, mid 2000s. Uh, apps was such a cool thing for a while. WordPress popped up. Everybody's a web developer now. I can build you a website over the weekend, give me a thousand bucks. I have all these plugins. And then now the affiliate marketing starts. Buy my shit, buy my shit, buy my shit. Post, 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 video, video, video. Is anything really real? And now the influencers, which I don't want to comment on the influencers. They're something interesting uh, per se, but if you've not seen the Fire Festival documentary, I have to watch that. Voice is huge. Voice is going to be huge. I've started to challenge myself more, asking my phone to give directions, asking my phone to uh, text people, asking my phone just to do all sorts of stuff. AI, obviously, is going to be big. Probably not for the next 20 years, but it's something we need to pay attention to. Augmented reality, as I talked about before going into the hospital, we're going to see more and more of that. And then robots will take over the world and we're all dead. So working with entrepreneurs, some very, very important things that I think a lot of people forget about, especially college students, is validation. 
we all have good skill sets, we all have good knowledge, but we forget to talk to customers. And I can't stress the importance of that with my students, and I feel like a lot of other entrepreneurs continuously struggle with what validation means to them. As investors, you need to figure out what validation means to them, because there's so many variables within different industries that we can't just say we talked to 100 people, or we already have two customers, or whatever the case may be. Vision is big. Establish that vision early on. Purpose, obviously, is big. The team is huge, especially the students that I work with, uh, the lack of skills and those types of things. What is it gonna take you to the next level? Do or try everything to understand. I, I, I just don't understand with certain entrepreneurs why you don't want to go out and try something. Google it, YouTube it, get your hands dirty. Brain, I think, and I'm not trying to portray my previous slides that Amazon's taken over the world and don't start up anything because they'll just gobble you up. So that's not my message at all. If anything is my message about that, it's the importance of branding. Branding is going to continue to be so important. I really do feel, which I'm sure a lot of you in the room, we will go back to smaller micro economies within cities and know where our meat comes from and know the people we do business with at some point. And that's why I think brands are so, so important to establish. Time management. I am struggling with this a lot, I think as entrepreneurs, do more. Um, so as early on as possible, work with people in time management. Whether you're an investor, learn those skills. I'm sorry, if you're an entrepreneur, learn those skills. If you're an investor, work with who you're investing with right away. Keep in mind, they have not done what you have done yet. They don't have all the skills. Time management, I think, is the most important thing. Not the skills or the knowledge behind the idea or the business, I think, knowing how to take them to the next level. You already gave them the money if you're investing in them. So show them how to manage their time. Um, not overextending when times are good, like I said, I've seen so much on social media. Um, it's very, very interesting. I found myself the other day thinking about HGTV shows 10 years ago, HD a &E TV shows 10 years ago, in terms of house flipping and all of that. All of that stuff is coming right back. The same, the same titles, the same hosts, all of that. So entrepreneurial resources, uh, for what it's worth. Some of this is meant to be a little fun, but um, I get a lot of students complain. I don't have a 3D printer. I don't know how to make a prototype. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. Well, if you've never learned about these two products, go buy them and make something. One is called Quick Steel. It's two putties. You form it into anything, and it hardens up, and you can do something fun. Um, the other one's called Sergu. So Sergu is almost like a Play-Doh-ish uh, substance that's rubbery, and you can form it into anything. Make a prototype. There are no excuses. Both of those things cost anywhere from three to ten dollars. So the companies. I did get the opportunity to look at some of um, the pitches a little bit beforehand, and obviously watch the pitches. So I just got my two cents for what it's worth. Um, you know, with Tom and Tom and I talked a little bit about this. I think with whistleblowing or those types of things, I go back to the Ashley Madison thing, and some companies are doing this, but it's analyzing a lot of data that's going through a company emails purchase orders, everything, and figuring out ways to flag certain situations or uh, things that happened beforehand. The other thing that I think with the whistleblowing, as I've talked with Tom a little bit about, is more incentives for the employees. If you're making 14 bucks an hour, it doesn't sound great to go tell about something that's happening so your CEO can make $30 million a year. So there's more opportunities for data and kind of incentives. Um, the car company, if you haven't learned about what Elon is trying to do or talking about doing is he is envisioning people buying Teslas. You only use it for two hours a day. Their platforms and their software are already built in so your neighbor can take your Tesla, self-drive to the grocery store and bring it back and it drops off your neighbor. He takes out his uh, groceries and then it drives it back to your neighbor's garage and parks in. The reason I'm just saying that, I think the fleet vehicle angle is absolutely a must, but as the market changes, more of us have self-driving cars, what is that going to look like in terms of servicing those types of vehicles? I'm not going to pretend like I know anything about RNA or DNA. All I know is those are different curly hair strains, and there's something around RNA and DNA that make those curly hair different. Um, my beautiful fiance over there does work at the Van Andel uh, Research Institute, so make sure I uh, connect you with her um, before you go. So keep learning. Get out and network. Um, so, so important. What I would challenge the entrepreneurs to do is obviously get out and network 
It's a, it's a must. What I challenge the investors to do is go somewhere you don't feel comfortable going. Number one, you'll know what it's like to be an entrepreneur again. And number two, you might find something that you weren't searching for by not looking for it where you always try to look for it. So I challenge you to do those. Again, get your hands free. I can't stress enough for entrepreneurs to work on things. Um, read, 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 read. Uh, some interesting platforms you've never heard of edX. There's a lot of free courses you can take through MIT, through Harvard, through other universities that have that the platform. YouTube, Udemy is a huge one. And lastly, what can I help you guys with? And I am getting married this summer, so I put these two movies on purpose with affiliate links, so if you buy them, I will make money, because right, I'm not authentic, I'm just trying to sell you guys something too, which is not true. But Demolition Man, if you don't remember, that movie is very futuristic. It has self-driving cars in it, so I think the company can learn something. Every time you swear, you get a ticket, so I think Safe Muscle can learn something from it too. In Gattaca, if you haven't seen that movie, uh, Ethan Hawke in the 90s is all about DNA in manipulating your child with genetics. So you want them to be tall, short. So that is what I leave you, and I'm here to help anybody, and thank you guys for letting me come.